affects society. That's something that we need to address because you see, what you think about origins will have an effect on your other beliefs. If evolution were true, if we were just the result of random chemistry acting over time, then we're really no different from any other animal. And a lot of people think that way, and it justifies, at least in their own mind, their actions. Why not abort babies? After all, if, if uh, human beings are just random chemical accidents, get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids, what's the difference? But you see, if creation is true, which of course it is, then human beings are made in the image of God. And so Christians who are thinking biblically will understand that abortion is fundamentally wrong because human beings are made in the image of God. And they're made that way from conception, is what the Bible teaches. What about marriage, for example? That's an issue in our culture today. What should marriage be? Is it one man and one woman, or two men, or who knows? You see, marriage is a creation concept. God is the one that instituted marriage, and he did that in Genesis. He created Adam and Eve, and he specifically tells us in Genesis that this is the reason that the man leaves his family and joins to his wife, and the two are one in the eyes of God. Marriage is instituted by God, which means he gets to define what it is. And marriage is one man and one woman united by God for life. But if evolution were true, then that means that marriage is just a cultural trend because there's no Adam and Eve. And so that means we're just basically evolved animals. Animals do what they want, so why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we redefine marriage to be whatever we want it to be? And of course, that's not just a hypothetical issue. That's something we're seeing happening in our society today. If we're going to properly deal with these issues in society, we need to get back to Genesis and understand that God's word is true from the beginning. Show people that, yes, indeed, God created things the way he says he did. And that's why marriage is the way it is. That's why human life is so valuable. That's why we have clothing. That's why we have all these different Christian things that we teach. It all goes back to creation. And when people understand that, then all these other issues fall up. So if you get rid of spare cats, why not just get rid of spare babies? I mean, that's a quite a statement, isn't it? Um, um, I used to be so mean towards cats. Um, not really. I mean, I had a cat growing up. Happy was our cat, and I loved Happy. But we were primarily dog people. And um, and people would ask me, why do you hate cats? And I would say, I don't hate cats. They're great in Chile, you know, or stuff like that. But, but at some, now, at some point, we became cat people. We love we love kitty cats, you know. Our, our little cat is so. It just, I don't know. She claimed us. Yeah, she claimed us, and uh, but. Um, this is a really good point, isn't it? Have you ever thought about this? When when people have a sickness, there's symptoms of the sickness. And a lot of times we focus on the symptoms, right? But what do doctors do? Doctors want to know what's underneath these symptoms. Am I right about yeah, that? Yeah, like what causes what, it? Yeah, what is the cause of this? And so it's definitely that way in our society, isn't it? Um, people who, who don't value traditional marriage, um, or if they, if they don't have a value for human life, what's the cause underneath that? Well, if you've been told your whole life, we just came from a blob and we returned to a blob, and that's all there is, why would you care, right? They're just following it to the natural conclusion, exactly. But what does that say to you? What thoughts does that prompt for all of you seeing that first video? Well, Any? Yeah. You know, I think out of that, looking under the hood, right, that problem, right. I, I think that leads to euthanasia. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. And, uh, you know, just. Well, Nazi, Sun Nazism? I mean, the Darwinism? It, absolutely. Sunday um, was one of the most different sermons for me ever, talking about automated or artificial intelligence, robotics, and things like that. <laughs> they didn't teach that in Bible college when I was grow going to school, Pastor Z. Whoever saw that coming, that a moral issue of our day would be 
that there would be robots that are becoming more and more human-like, humanoid, with the ability to actually reason and figure out problems. And I mean, we didn't get into it, but there, there are robots that can tell you, okay, you've got nine eggs and an encyclopedia, and you've got a laptop computer and a, a feather. I need you to arrange it in a way so everything stays intact. And they can figure out, well, you know, the encyclopedia would be a good base. Let's position the nine eggs just so that the laptop, the soft part of the laptop can be open and lay on that. And then, I mean, that takes reasoning, like figuring things out. And, um, but where it's all headed is, is very frightening because there's huge moral implications. I mean, we didn't even get into some of the scary things Sunday, but yeah. Well, have you seen the movie I Robot? Yes. Yeah, no, but I've heard yes. of it. Okay. Yes. Yes. Now that is a prime example yeah. of we can build the robots, and they can get so sophisticated that they're so far above us that they can take over. It, it's yeah. Okay. And it and it's frighteningly real. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh, any for the for the yeah, this bicentennial man. That's what I told him, okay. Robin Williams. I okay. mean, he married. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, oh, okay. AI, and they got married in their the later other one? years. I didn't see the Matrix, but somebody was there. telling me the Matrix kind of yeah. was in all oh, those yeah. too. So. There's, there's also a movie that's called Artificial Intelligence mm -hmm. about a little kid that was a, um, a a robot, but he was so intelligent that it's the long sequel that I won't tell you that. Uh -huh, like uh -huh. that too. Yeah, interesting. Well, so, there was a movie called Daryl. Yeah. Right. About a little boy <laughs> yeah, that it. had a computer, miniature computer, and standing in his brain. That's it, yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, so, all right, there was a show in the 80s, I think, growing up, I would see it. This is my brother Daryl. My other brother Daryl. Yeah. <laughs> that was uh, the new heart. That was hey, the new heart show. Wasn't oh, that was my yeah. heart. I've, I've worked in that scenario. <laughs> <laughs> I lived it. No, no. <laughs> okay, I just, I more off from. Short comment. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I was reading an article yesterday, okay, and it was about a prominent college professor Okay, saying that people going to college these days, they've got to learn AI because in the very near future, it will be their co-pilot in jobs. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. I and I'm, don't doubt that at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, all of these warehouses that are getting built all around the valley, yeah. um, I'm excited for the jobs they will provide, but do you know what the issue is? Is we have this thing called COVID and people don't want to work anymore. So we're having trouble finding workers, but we can build them and they can go up to the 12th level and grab something and come right back down so fast. And it's kind of, yeah, it's frightening. Anyway, um, uh, not just in that sense, but I'm thinking more of the spiritual implications of can a robot marry a human? They want to. Can a robot hold citizenship? They already do in Saudi Arabia. Um, I, wow. Yeah, where does this thing go? All right, here, here we go, this next one. God's Word is the filter. When I was young, I had a tremendous interest in science. And having been reared in a Christian home, I'm very grateful for that. I loved the Lord and I wanted to serve Him. And so it was only a matter of time that I would end up reading a book that had evolution in it. And I can remember it was a dinosaur book. I was very young, loved dinosaurs, what little boy doesn't. And I'm reading this book on dinosaurs that talked about how one kind evolved into another. And I remember thinking, well, that's not right, because I'd read Genesis, and I knew that the Lord created certain kinds of organisms. And I remember asking my dad about that. I, I remember, first of all, being kind of angry at the book. You know, what, what's, what's going on? Or confused. And then I asked my dad about it, and he said, well... He gave me very good advice. He said, well, we don't, uh, we don't believe that. So we believe what the Bible teaches. It was just that simple. And I remember being very angry at the book for having lied to me because I loved science. And it was, it was depressing for me and, and irritating to pick up a book that is supposed to excite me and teach about God's creation. And instead it was telling me a, a story, a fictional story, as if it were true. It made me very angry. And then I wanted to throw the book away. 
And I asked my dad again, you know, should I just toss it? And then he gave me another piece of advice that I, I've treasured for this day. He says, no, because it's got some good stuff in it. <coughs> you see, what he was doing is he was teaching me discernment. He was teaching me that not everything you read is necessarily factual. You have to think through these issues. And as Christians, we need to filter what we observe in the world. We need to filter it through God's Word. That's something that I, I uh, still apply today, because I find that God's Word is always true. Let God be true, though every man a liar, the Bible says. And now I, I go around teaching people this and, and showing them how science confirms biblical creation, how it lines up with it when you understand the facts. And I see the light bulb go on. And this is why creation science is important to me. It's not just because I have an interest in the science, which I do, but it's because I want people to be saved. I want them to recognize that God's word is true from the beginning, and therefore I need to remove this myth, this stumbling block, that evolution is somehow supported by science. It isn't. Good science confirms biblical creation. Um, I still enjoy holding a book physically in my hand and um, turning turning the page, you know. Like, um, but our world is changing so fast. It, it's changing um, rapidly. The the um, the advent of the internet and online book and electronic books um, has changed our world the same way that in the year 300 when they decided to take Holy Scripture and bind it together in big leaflets and tie it into book form. People were outraged at that, but, but they were making a new change. And then in the 1500s when Gutenberg invented the printing press, and were able to start printing books, and they printed Bibles, and uh, in mass amounts, that was a huge, huge leap forward. Um, my father-in-law was always very intuitive, very forward-thinking. He was really ahead of his time. Um, he would go to the genius desk at the Apple store, and he knew the stuff to tell them. He had to tell the guys who were working. And, um, and he would sometimes make statements like, my generation is so embarrassing, coming in with a yellow tablet and writing down, well, you're holding a tablet right there, you're reading, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. But it, um, I remember one time him saying, oh, well, I've got to give, gotta give books away because books are heavy. And, and um, he had collected, I don't know how many thousand books in his library through the years. But he, I think he also saw that his time was starting to wind down and that his two sons who were preachers would have to, his two sons and one son-in-law two of us are preachers they'll have to do something with all these books you know and he started weeding through and asking us who wanted this one or that one and and um, and then he started giving them away started giving them away and i remember him one day taking his ipad and saying i have more books in here than i ever had in my whole library <laughs> <laughs> the world changes, you know. I still do, though. I, I do enjoy uh, reading books, physical books, and holding them, but I do both. And um, I, one of the great tools, Gordy, you use it as well, but I use Logos yeah. Bible software. It has 35,000 books in it, and it's on one piece of software, and I can consult it instantly. And it has all of this information. It's amazing. Um, I read broad. Um, I try to be careful and cautious about books that I keep right prominent on my bookshelves because people come in my office and they'll go, oh, you read that guy? You Well, I don't agree with him, yeah. but I read. I want to know. And I, I think that was fantastic advice that his dad gave him. No, don't throw it away because there's some good stuff in there. But read in a discerning way and, and learn. Um, he's going to get into this idea of creation versus evolution. Um, but I, I love what he said is, is basically learn and be discerning and keep your Holy Spirit filter up as you're going through life. Yeah. Um, now, what are your thoughts, guys? What, what do you think about all of that? I think nursing is a lot like that too because 
we hear and we see and we read all these different things like and as a nurse you have to be discerning about what's really true and what's really mm. right and like no that's nonsense kind of thing so yeah i mean that's one industry that must by virtue of by very <laughs> definition has to be right on that cutting edge and i'm sure it has to be I challenging every, to every filter single it. Day, every yeah. single day yeah. mm -hmm. There's, a, there's an example of discernment and being widely read, uh, A.W. Tozer, mm. which I just love. Uh, he's kind of a mystic in a little way, you know, a modern day mystic, although he's dead now. But uh, he's, the, the article was talking about, he loves Thoreau, uh, Thoreau how do you pronounce it? Uh, Thoreau. No, Thoreau. Uh, he was a philosopher and kind of a, uh, Henry Thoreau, H.W. Thoreau, was yeah. that the guy? Yeah, Thoreau, H.W. Okay. Thoreau, which, you know. And I'm not that familiar with him. I don't well, he, he uh, <laughs> his thought patterns go along with Unitarianism. Oh, and okay. he was one of the early founders of trans Transcendental Meditation. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, but yeah. uh, A.W. Tozer thoroughly enjoyed reading. He was able to, as I say in my crude manner, eat the meat and spit out the bones, okay? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So there's good, uh, that's just the point of being uh, discerning in your reading yeah, and, yeah. and being able to, to, to glean from everything. And not, I think that's one of my fears of the message series that I'm currently doing called Playlist yeah. is that people will get the impression that I'm saying, oh, poor little helpless Christians, let's don't be offended by anything around us. Let's make sure we filter every little, and that's, that's not the point of it. Um, the point of it is that to me, intrinsically, it matters what we're playing over and over in our mind. That's the point. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. It, it affects us. But we're not little weak Christians who have to hide from the world and live in a cocoon either. We rather we experience life with all of its joys and all of its pleasures and and we walk by the conviction that God's spirit lives in us in us and we are different we we approach life differently so uh, how about that statement from Romans let every man be a liar and God's word be true amen yeah. right on yeah. right on amen yeah. amen how many times do you think through the centuries men thought oh, we've got him now we've proved him wrong now yeah. only to and God's just not shaking in the heavens he's just yeah I, I am the essence of truth I, he could he could zap them but over time then you begin to see the fallacy of their thinking and God's word was true after all yeah. Let every man, every man on the planet Earth be a liar, but God, he will be true. I mean, there's constant archaeological discoveries that prove all the points of the historical value of the Old Testament, New Testament, and it just gets better and better Amen. as time goes on. Amen to that. Uh, anybody else? Well, uh, our founding fathers knew that technology was going to advance, so they put the language in the Constitution so you know, hey, it's not all going to be written. But someone there says, hey, they just invented the printing press and everything. We are moving ahead. Wow. So they, th that language does, does exist in there. And no matter what the technology is, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. these words are going to be, you know, our Constitution is going to survive and still be read. Yeah. By the way, you forgot about Hal. Oh, okay. Well, go ahead. My favorite. Yeah. 2001 in space, obviously. Yeah, okay. We got to include that. Yeah, yeah. You got to have them in there. Thank you for circling back around. Yeah. Dave, what are you doing? Uh, and, um, you know, um, I'm fascinated by what you said about the, the foresight of our forefathers to craft right. language that way. Um, on Memorial Day, um, I, I put a, a, a post on Facebook that was about Abe Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And 
I, I, we watched a documentary on it. I was amazed by Lincoln's brilliance. The guy that spoke before him, I can't call his name without reading it in front of me, but he was a public orator, very respected. Everybody loved him. He spoke for two hours while Lincoln is waiting as the president to go to the podium and speak. Presidents didn't give speeches in the, that day. That just was not a thing. And, uh, but he gave a speech and he steps up at Gettysburg where 28,000 um, uh, 28, died from the South, 23,000 men from the North. It, by all counts, the most horrific tragedy in our nation's history. And so he's, he basically stands up and says, this is hollow ground. That we're, we're here to dedicate this place, but who are we to dedicate this? We, they dedicated it with their lives. But he did something really amazing, and I think it ties into what you were saying, Tony. His speech was only two minutes long. It was 272 words. And um, it was um, so short that the official photographer didn't even get his camera set up in time to get a picture of it. <laughs> That's how short his speech was. And some of you are saying, Pastor Keith, take note of that, okay? <laughs> yeah. no. But he knew that because it was only 272 words, those reporters could go to the Telegraph and every newspaper in the nation would print the entire speech like that. Like that. It's brilliant. I mean, it really, and, and, it was, and it is quite an amazing speech. I, I kind of got off track a little bit. Okay, let's go forward with this next one. You know, some evolutionists like to phrase the debate as evolution versus creationism. And for some reason, they like to add that ism on the creation. And I think that's to emphasize that it's a belief system. But of course, evolution is a belief system, isn't it? And so it's really what we call a question-baiting epithet fallacy. And that's the fallacy of using emotional language to try and persuade somebody of something that maybe doesn't have factual support. The fact is that the science confirms creation. And so creation, really, if you took a belief in creation, is far more rational than a belief in evolution. And so I won't debate evolution versus creationism. I'll debate evolution versus creation, or evolutionism, the belief in evolution versus creationism. So let's be fair here and use the terms properly. So um, I don't know if you paid attention to the way it was in the announcements on the screens and in the bulletin, but yours truly called it um, evolution versus creationism. I fell for it. I didn't even, I've, that's the thing, I've never even thought about that and what it implies, but that little ism on the end of there that's exactly what it does. It's like, oh, that's something they believe, creationism. But it's far more um, reliable. We're going to go on to the next one because it, it kind of connects with that. And does the Bible have contradictions? What about Bible contradictions? That's a question I get asked a lot. And, and we do have a resource on that. It's called Keeping Faith in an Age of Reason. It answers 420 alleged Bible contradictions. There was a prominent post that circulated on the internet a while back, uh, promoted by some atheist groups, where they had a list of alleged Bible contradictions. It turned out to be 420, supposedly. And I thought, well, I want to go through and, and check those out and investigate those and see, are any of these real contradictions where the Bible actually affirms and denies something at the same time and in the same sense? And I found that, no, not one, not one of those 420 alleged contradictions turned out to be legitimate. In most cases, the critic just wasn't reading the text carefully. There were perhaps two different events that the Bible was describing, and the critic seemed to think they were one because he didn't read it carefully. Or in some cases, he didn't go back and check the original language to see what the original Hebrew and Greek said. But in most cases, it was just carelessness on the uh, part of the critic. I think this book is really going to encourage Christians because it, it addresses these issues that come up. People often accuse the Bible of having contradictions, but when you read it carefully, you're going to find that it has a consistency that can only be accounted for by having been written by the mind of God. So check it out. Keeping faith in the nature of reason. Leave that on there in case any of you want to. Yeah. 
to order that, I think it'd be a really good resource. Jason Lyle, Keeping Faith in an Age of Reason. Um, I was going to ask if you had written any books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So what, um, what evolutionists like to do is say that um, the Bible is far more reliable just in terms of being a document than any other written resource anywhere on the planet. I've alluded to this before, but there are only nine extant editions of Plato. There's only eight of Aristotle. These are very respected, you know, philosophers. And But for the Bible, we should be embarrassed at the plethora of resources um, as I throw the remote to the floor. I, I, that was a mic drop moment. I just dropped that mic. Um, 5,600 manuscripts. Um, some, are, some are complete books of the Bible, complete scrolls. Some of them are um, lexical little texts that have exist that have lasted through the centuries and been kept and preserved. We could take all of those materials, and even if we didn't have the four major first works: Codex Sinaiticus, Codex, Codex Vaticanus, Codex Alexandrius. I'm uh, I'm forgetting one of. Uh, there's four of them that were the early, early, early. Even if we didn't have those, we could recreate the entire Bible based upon just the text that we have preserved. So um, don't let it throw you when, like I have said before, okay, we don't have any of the autographs. That means the originals that were written by Peter, by Paul, by James. We don't have those. But what we do have are carefully copied identical scripts that were handed down sometimes one person looking at one text and writing it letter for letter and if they knew there was an error they would burn it and destroy it because they wanted to preserve the beauty of the text sometimes um, a speaker at a, a lectern with 30 scribes in the room and he's reading out verbally and they're writing down very carefully every word he said there's such great care and by the way, there are no autographs of Plato or Socrates or any of those guys either. So don't let that throw you. That's just the nature. We're talking about ancient documents, but God has preserved His Holy Bible. You want to talk about contradictions? Pick up a legal paper. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, exactly. yes. Well said, yes. Um, uh, one of the things that... Um, our board is enjoying this year is we're um, we're slowly over the months working through our constitution and bylaws and I remind me ARS what is that even Arizona, Arizona revised statutes Arizona revised statutes and three nine six seven six one three dot 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 Z six, X Y <laughs> Z, oh my goodness like legalese and it is necessary, but you're exactly right. We get a couple of New York lawyers in the room and you've got contradictions <laughs> big time. I can't follow an Arizona lawyer. <laughs> get the New York. <laughs> okay, so um, we're going down a rabbit trail, but what is what does this evoke for you? What thoughts do you have? What is faith and what is fact? I remember a teacher writing that on a board when I was in fifth grade. And he wrote the word faith, larger, much larger font than the fact. He said, this is a big word. So I, but I always remember that when like, I hear something, faith, fact. So then now, now I'm saying, okay, which one to yeah. have faith yeah. and which one is based more on fact? Yeah, this yes. Is yeah. And probably that teacher 
didn't even have, I mean, for sure, he didn't have all the information that we have now. And there, I mean, I've been in situations as a teacher where you're trying to follow a curriculum, you're trying to satisfy it, and, and they expect you to teach this, this, and this, and, and you're looking at it and going, yeah, that's follow logic. It just, but we got to meet standards, and you know, so you just charge forward, and I mean, I had, I had English teachers tell me wrong on stuff. Like, I got to graduate level work when I learned that it's, I-T-S, does not have an apostrophe when it's possessive. I'm writing papers and I'm going, wait, that's not what Miss Scott said in ninth grade. She, she didn't know. Of course, she got fired for drinking vodka. That's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> she really did. Now that, 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 okay, that is a story. My mom, the first six weeks of ninth grade English class, I, I failed. I had an F for the six weeks. And mom said, you're not trying. You're being disrespectful to her. You're goofing off in class. Mom, I promise I'm not. I, and... Here's what you're going to do. Tomorrow morning, you're going to go and apologize to Miss Scott, and you're going to say, Mom, I didn't do it. Yes, you did, and you're going to. I mean, our rule was if you got in trouble at home, you got in trouble at I mean, if you got in trouble at school, you got in trouble at home. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. Try that one nowadays, by the way. That, uh -oh. doesn't, that doesn't, doesn't quite work. But, so I go in and I apologize to her the next morning. The next five straight Six week periods, I got a straight A. I didn't do one thing different. Not one thing. So, but mom was convinced I did. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, she, she taught us some things that were wrong, but it, that we're getting on the real rabbit trail there. We're going down the rabbit hole. Um, I, I didn't really stop in between, but, but that is really important how things are framed. Things. Fact. Evolution, creationism. Yeah. Like there's, there is a way to frame something if you want to get your point across. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, I, I think we're going to go forward. Did everybody get that info written down? We're, we're I want to get that book out. Yeah, I think that would be really good. Oh, I. Let's, Gordy, you might be able to help on this. I was thinking, he, he brought out something really important, and that was um, when people say the Bible is full of contradictions, he wanted to just look at it and say, okay, are there any places where there are contradictions? They're saying these are contradictions, where it says this in one place, but something totally opposite in another place. And what he said is so true, most of the time people just... They didn't take time to actually read the text carefully, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when when someone says to you, the Bible has errors, what starts going in your mind? Like, what do you think that they mean by that? Um, do you want to elaborate on well, that a little one bit? Of the, one of the core principles that, we, and I went to a Pentecostal Bible college, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you know, one of the things that we learned was there's no errors in the Bible, even though people say they are, and there are instances where you might assume that. But the, the idea of Bible study is to have an assumption that there are no errors. There are no things that need to be corrected. You just have to dig deep enough to find it. And right. go with that faith that it, yeah. it is correct. Find it out. I think that's very well said. It, it's sort of let every man be a liar. God's word is true oh, yeah. language, but it, it is really important. Um, it's not saying put a blindfold on. Rather, it's saying really ask yourself what is being said here. What's actually being said? What's being communicated? Yep. Daryl, did I see your hand? Yeah. The the term that a lot of people that don't believe in the Bible, refuse to accept is that the Bible is the inspired yeah. Word of God. Yes. One of our core beliefs, um, we have 16 fundamental truths in the Assemblies of God, and we believe that the Bible is God's Holy Word, infallible, 
incapable of error. Yes. Okay. And that is is true. I man, I tell you what, there have been steps along the way where I've had to to ask hard questions. Um, I, I remember hearing the statement when I was growing up in a Pentecostal church, never ask God why, that's a lack of faith. But then Al Reaver, uh, when we were on staff at uh, Al, Al and Arnita uh, Reaver's church uh, in Lake Worth, Texas, uh, it's the, the lake at Fort Worth, it's right in that area. He, he said, some of the greatest faith increases in my life have been when I had the courage to say, God, why? And it sent me on a journey. I dug deeper and I learned. And so um, I understand the rationale behind we don't question God. That's not what we're saying. But we're always searching and looking. And, and um, the, the premise, though, we begin with the fact that it's God's Word and God is true and He's not going to lead us astray. And um, so anyway... Let's go on with this next one. Is this our last one? I don't remember. <clears throat> yeah, what is the ultimate proof for creation? This one is one minute long. This one is the best one of all 25. <laughs> Pay attention. It's really good. <clears throat> what is the ultimate proof of creation? Is there one argument for biblical creation that utterly refutes molecules to man evolution? Well, it turns out there is. And the ultimate proof is, if the Bible weren't true, you couldn't prove that anything is true or know anything. You see, in order for us to know anything about the universe scientifically, logically, the universe would have to be a certain way. There would have to be patterns in nature. I mean, science is all about discovering patterns in nature. That would be pretty hard if there were no patterns in nature. But the human mind would have to be capable of rational thought and able to, to consider various options and then choose the best. Now, if you think about it, those are the things that the Bible says the universe is. The universe does have patterns in it because these patterns have been imposed on it by the Creator. The universe is not just an accident. It's a creation of God, and as such, it has orderliness to it. In fact, God has promised us that the future will be like the past in terms of these orderly cycles. In Genesis 8.22, he promises the basic seasons, the cycles of nature, will continue to be as they have been. The Bible tells us that the human mind has been made in the image of God, and therefore we have the capacity to think in a way that's consistent with God's character. We have the capacity to think truthfully. And so for these reasons, science is possible, and human beings can have knowledge about the universe. But if evolution were true, there's no reason to think that the brain would have the capacity to make rational decisions. After all, it would just be the byproduct of countless accidental mutations that have accumulated over billions of years. There's no reason to expect any kind of orderliness in the universe at all if it were just an accidental byproduct of a big bang. No, creation makes sense because if it weren't true, you couldn't know that anything is true. Pretty good stuff, huh? <laughs> um, when I was um, in trigonometry, which I made an A plus in, I really brag about that. Some of you have heard the story, but our, our trig teacher, um, he didn't understand trigonometry. And there was this one genius kid in the class named, uh, it, it was a boy named Jan. And, and Jan, man, he was a firecracker. Every day we'd go in the class, the teacher would look at the book, look at the board, look at the book, look at Jan, look at the book, look at the board. <laughs> and then he would say, Jan, do you understand this? Yes, sir. I'll tell you what, Jan, you come out and work, come up to the board, work out problems one through five. The rest of you copy down what Jan does and, and that'll be our lesson for the day. I copied it down. I made an A plus. I don't know what sine or cosine means. I don't know what a tangent is or a cotangent. I couldn't. Uh, but I do, in, I remember this one thing. In that class, they said mathematics was the first science. I never thought of it that way. Because you always had English, 
math, science, and then our favorite PE, you know, and lunch, right? It was its own thing. But it started, yeah, started making sense. There's a lot of scientific formula in mathematics. In fact, when you study the philosophers, all of them were mathematicians of a sort. Think about this. Um, those of you that have studied music in any sense, how is it that you could find eight notes in an octave in a repeating pattern that allows you to combine them into harmonies? How does that stuff just happen to happen? Yeah. I, music oh, is all math. It is. It, I've said that before. It's mathematics. It, and uh, I was talking about Al Reaver um, earlier. This will blow you away. He was... He graduated 4.0 summa cum laude at uh, Rice University in Romantic Languages. Brilliant man. Um, he was not musical, but he read a book about how Beethoven um, could still play the piano even after he was deaf because he understood the math of music. And Al says, oh, that makes sense. Sat down and started playing the piano. <laughs> he did. Um, so. It is. It is mathematical. I'm, I'm blown away. I'm really intrigued by something that I don't have enough time to research in a lifetime. I heard that um, because there's technically 12 pitch tones in an octave and it repeats uh, if you use the half steps, all the black keys on the piano. Um, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Eight notes, but the in-betweens would give you a total of 12. But there is a ten-stringed lyre in Jewish music, and I'm told that in ancient times they had tuned the ten strings so that there were there it was spaced differently than modern music. Instead of twelve notes in between ah uh, and ah, uh, there was only ten, and the the variation would give you a little bit bigger gap and a different tonality of music, a, a different frequency totally. I'm telling you, I've heard that, but I mean, that's, that's one of you eggheads, go figure it out. That's too hard for me to even factor, but, but God just allowed us to have this playground called Earth. Just go out there and create. Go be little creators. I mean, that, just think of that, that right there is a reason why creation is true. And he made a really good point. If, if evolution is true, why would we even care to learn? How could we possibly hope that we... Because it just all happened to come together by chance? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So, all right, what are your thoughts? We're closing out this this uh, session. This this has been an awesome month. Yeah, Tony? I have told my students that math is the only pure science, and they would ask me why. Uh -huh. I just lie to you. You will always get the truth at the end. Yep. I've always taught that. I said, it was weird, but it's true. Look at all your science. You know science. what? That's, that's right. And... Um, I had an algebra teacher in ninth grade that said numbers are constant. It's an exact science. And they are. Exact. How could you expect for numbers to be constant? How could there be prime numbers? And you know those, the ones that cannot be factored except, you know, uh, what would be an example? Three is prime, three yeah. times one. You can't divide it any further than that. I think five is one, is, uh, I don't remember, seven maybe, then 11, I don't remember, but there's prime numbers. You, and you can, how is it that you can take a calculator and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, plus nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one equals, and it will come up with a, a constant, and it, it, there's all kinds of formulas, it, it'll just happen, and it, you were talking about uh, last week, remember? Um, the incredible space science that went into landing on the moon and factoring in, well, but the Bible says there was one extra day and there was a, a ten uh, 
10 steps that it moved back on the sundial mm -hmm. and, you know I mean <clears throat> it, it's incredible they said in a movie called Hidden Figures is oh, about right. the space program all right oh, yeah, I saw that. and was there was a lady in there and she said that mathematics is the only pure language <laughs> that we can't alter it is what right. it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And until you go back and calculate and add in all the changes through time mm -hmm. that God has allowed to happen, you can't get the numbers to come up right. Mm -hmm. I, I love that movie too. That's uh, fascinating. Hidden like numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Keeping that in mind, when you go to biology class, right? Or, or like in college biology, they'll tell you about the primordial soup, right? Uh -huh. So professors try to convince you that what's primordial soup? You got a bunch of chemicals in there, and somehow spark came in there, and so. there were cells, and they and they evolved. Uh, but that's not constant. Let's say with something like mathematics, it does. Right. 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 There is no true chaos theory hmm. that's going <laughs> to be. True. It's chaos. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? So no, that, I don't believe that this yeah. will happen in a pool of mud or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And then all of a sudden, a few million years later, here we are having this discussion somehow because there was a spark inside that uh, puddle of mud, and here we are now speaking about right, these right. advanced things and even God. So that. Yeah, was you're not exactly true. right because there's something that t when somebody says. Two plus two equals five. Okay. We we all know. No, <laughs> no, it doesn't. You know. You can't make it do that. No matter what you do, you can't make it do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the sciences. My first two years of college, uh, I, I took. A, I was in engineering for civil engineering, and then I switched mm -hmm. majors. And uh, but it's like you 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 got your algebra, your trig. And then that builds into where you can explore calculus, you know. And all the engineering sciences, all the hard sciences, are based upon calculus, you know, engineering. And I'm trying this. I'm trying to remember what is there's a term for three pronged edges. Geometry. What is well, it? No, no, try. Finally. What are you, which word? Try, try, uh, it's similar yeah. to that, but it, in nature you see a stick and then it branches off. Uh -huh. And and it, there's symmetry. Even though a tree might have branches going all over the place, but you, you keep finding, it's, I can't numbers. think of the word, but oh, there's, I know, I know there's three of them. No, no, it's in the, but the, interestingly, when you when you study even the coastline of the United States, of not the United States, but of, of continents of all of the seven continents, you see the same pattern that you see in a bush or whatever. You see it along yeah. the edges. It's it's a form of order. Yeah, to, uh, yeah. The word out of my head, but anyway, but. That's really close, but there's no, I can't think of the word, but anyway, <coughs> that's what happens when you, you get up in front it's of people start talking. It's talking about a Fibonacci number. The Fibonacci, yeah. that's what I was thinking. It, it's, it, I see I it all through nature. That word. You just told me a new word. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is what, it's what uh, uh, math, uh, you'll see it in nature, and, you'll see, and if it's a mathematic, it's, it's incredible. And you'll find it all over the place mm. where you look. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I think the I think movie. then what we need to do is get these two geniuses and just have them face each other and talk it out. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to pick his brain. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Well, awesome. <laughs> the the way that man has evolved in the mathematic world. Okay, we keep changing things to be able to make things work out because mm. this math works, but it's not allowing us to do this. So we change it to do this. Mm. All right. Mm. And there was a statement in that same movie 
where they were trying to go from an elliptical orbit right. to a parabellum orbit. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And there was nothing they could do to work it out until this one girl thought we that need to go back. We need to go. Yeah. And she yeah. went back, and they said that's ancient. But they, she said works. math works. Right. She yeah. got it, and she got yes. it within two thousandths of what they were looking for. Oh man! Right. You know. <laughs> so incredible. Well, uh, you know, if if nothing else, I hope all of us are encouraged in our faith more than anything. God's holy word will stand the test of any yeah. close scrutiny. It is pure. It is unadulterated. It is God's word, and and. We don't have to live <coughs> in fear that somebody else has figured out something and they're going to trump us or whatever. Yeah. I have one word. Actually, through <coughs> Pardon me. DNA. Oh, well, there you go. Um, I used to be able to say the whole thing. Can any of you tell us the long word for DNA? Diosity will play a passive. Okay. <laughs> he wins. <laughs> Boom. Uh, yeah, okay. But that's exactly right. Go ahead. Yeah, I do, sweetheart. Thanks very much for asking. That's just uh, that's amazing. <clears throat> oh, that's better. Thank you. But does and the then, DNA run the whole universe? I believe so in it? different ways. What do you I think about it. I think that um, I've heard, and I'm not sure if this is accurate, but I believe it is that each individual has so much DNA in them that if you were able to take it and lay it out in one long strand, it would reach to the moon and back for one person. That's the level of intricate design in each one of us. Um, you can go vastly into the enormity of the entire universe and you see order and structure. And yet you go deep, deep down inside of us where they can't even, they're still dis, uh, discovering ways to work with nanotechnology because it feels like they're doing surgery with boxing gloves on. They've got to get smaller tools, smaller tools. But it, everything they discover shows order and structure. And, and numbers. Yeah, so. Well, okay, guys, this concludes uh, five weeks of, of study. Why don't we just bow our heads and pray, and, uh, and we'll dismiss. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us the privilege of, of learning this knowledge. We may not be able to recite every fact or figure, but... It does give us some talking points to just stand up and say, no, wait a minute, that's not actually correct. And I, I hope that, that we can leave from here with a decrease of arrogance and more humility because people are only suffering uh, the effects of um, having been taught wrong things and, and they want to be accurate, they want to be right. So there's these symptoms of the belief system that has been force fed to them. I hope that we can be a ray of light to, to cause people to think about it and to not just fall headlong into some nonsensical belief system. One thing we know, Lord, your word is true. It's yes. not a fable. It's true. And we can trust you. So help us to go deeper into your word more and more and to rely upon you. Someday when we've been in eternity for eons of time, I don't even know how time passes there. <sighs> It will matter very little, all of the line upon line and pretenses and dogmas of men. It will matter very little how many books were published or how many letters followed someone's name. All that will matter is if we know you and take you and accept you for who you are. 
So in the spirit of John the Baptist, he must increase and I must decrease. Let us not feel like, oh, I've got a, a few more bullets to put in my gun. I've got an arsenal now. I can attack people. No, no, no. We, we want more humility to be able to look underneath the symptoms and display the true love of Christ to every individual. And there are so many people seeking. There are so many desperate people in this world right now. I continue to be bold enough to ask you to crisscross our lives with people who are searching, looking for hope. Give us the courage to speak up and to obey. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.